Hey you guys, this is Raphael from ShallowRelics.com. I hope you're doing well today. I sure am glad to get to be with you again. And today we're gonna to talk about something that you guys have asked about and I haven't done it because I didn't know exactly how to get the close-ups on things, but I'm getting the hang of it a little more now. So here we go. We're gonna talk about Confederate buckles and why you should buy them from someone that you trust. When People ask, why would you collect Civil War belt buckles? Because it does sound like an odd thing to do. One, it was a very personal item. The soldier would have had it on him every day that he served. And two, there are so many variations that it's a neat thing to collect. People have always liked collecting variations. And these have tons of variations. Today, we're gonna to talk about Confederate belt buckles. Confederate belt buckles are one of the most expensive areas of collecting just because there are a lot of variations. The guys that started collecting early liked the variations and they wanted all of them. And so it made them a desirable thing. You didn't find a lot of them because you gotta remember, in order for somebody to lose a belt buckle, something has gone terribly awry. And when you're metal detecting, you don't find them very often. So the guys that were lucky enough to find them then and now, cherish them. Because if you've ever been a dealer at a show trying to buy the one Confederate buckle that the guy has ever dug in his life, you're most of the time more likely to be able to purchase a child or his wife a lot easier. These are a couple of variations to show you some of the styles of Confederate buckles from the Civil War. The guys that were just the frontline soldiers that didn't have much money and the government wasn't gonna spend much money on them because they didn't have a lot of money to spend had simple, very generic, make do kind of buckles, such as this one. This is known to collectors as a frame buckle for obvious reasons. It's just a frame of brass, cast brass. Uh, and this style is actually known as the gutter back because there's a little ridge that runs all the way around it. And that was designed to make them last a little bit longer. That's what your regular fighting man would have been wearing in the trenches. That uh, there's a several different variations because they tried a little bit of everything. You'll see them uh, big, big sizes, small sizes. There's a couple of great books out there. Uh, my friend Steve Mullinax that uh, passed a few years ago has the best one currently. Um, <laughs> talking about Steve, some of you guys said that you liked hearing some of my little stories because I've got a few because... Uh, I ramble a lot. So I was at a show and I was buying and selling and I was coming up through the ranks and I was really glad to be there. And Steve Mullinax, the guy that wrote the book, brought, brings up a buckle and I'm looking at it and he says, hands it to me, he says, well, what do you think of that? And I thought, holy cow, it's like Ringo Starr walks up and says, hey, how do you play these drums here? That's how I felt that day. And it was one of the coolest days of my life. I, I don't even remember what I said about it because I was like, Steve Mullinax just asked me if I, uh, what I thought about this buckle. So you can be starstruck in a relic business just as much as you can anywhere. And I was, and I hope Rhett Steve is resting well today. Uh, his wife, Patricia, my best to you if you do get a chance to see this. I love you and I love your husband. I, I hope that y'all, uh, hope he's resting well. Uh, we miss him and thank you for all that he did for our hobby. Now, back to the buckles. If they had more money and they were wearing a fancy sword belt, a lot of times they will wear a, a plate that is called a tongue and wreath or a two-piece buckle. And there's a lot of variations because you can imagine all of the small makers around that were making these buckles. Well, most of them were made in Richmond, a lot in Atlanta, a uh, lot in Memphis with Thomas Leach and Company. This one is actually a style that is recovered fairly often in Culpeper, Virginia. 
And Culpeper's a neat place if you ever get a chance to go through there. A lot of good folks up there. Hi to all my friends up in that Culpeper area. They interlock, and that's why they call them the two-piece. When the soldier was taking off his sword belt, he would, could take that off quickly and easily. A lot of variations. As far as a value, the frame buckles will usually run, depending on condition, uh, as an excavated plate between four and $700. You'll see them most of the time. Now, most of the ones, 90, probably 95% of the ones you encounter are excavated because when they got them home, they didn't take care of them because they were just a simple uh, buckle on either a pigskin belt or just another leather belt and they kept wearing them. A non-excavated one, meaning it was handed down through the generations, can easily bring over $1,000. So it makes a lot of difference if you find one dug as compared to non-dug. The sword belt pieces, the key on those is that they match, that hopefully they came together, the colors are consistent. Remember what we talked about patina, just the coloration of a piece. Uh, these, you do see a little bit of variation because they wouldn't make both pieces a lot of times at the same time. What they do, they'd make a ton of the CS tongue portions and then they'd make a ton of the wreaths and then they'd put them together. Cause a friend of mine down in Georgia that repaired swords, he says, if you polish it enough, it all ends up bright gold brass. And that makes sense. I saved the one that you've probably been looking at the whole time for last because it's an important lesson to be learned on this buckle. This is one of the most desirable patterns that you will encounter during the Civil War. It was most likely made by Leach and Rigdon, Thomas Leach and Company in Memphis, Tennessee, and then they moved after Memphis fell and moved a couple of other times. It's known as the CS with stars for obvious reasons. We got the big CS in the center and it's surrounded by the stars, 11 stars. Now, the last one of these that I had on a belt, I sold for, it was either 30 or $35,000. Rare piece to find non-excavated on the original belt. Because it is such a valuable piece, there are a ton of crooks out there. And they have made that buckle amazingly well. This one is a reproduction. It was sold at one time. I bought a huge collection and everything came with it. This was in that huge collection. And it sold at one time for that level of money. The only way that you can tell is that the original of these buckles were made in a sand mold. They were, meaning they were literally, uh, they would take the mold, put the uh, design into the sand and cast it out of molten brass. The reproductions that you come across are made out of wax casts. So you have to look at the little detail. When you see one that's fresh out of a sand mold, you can actually see the indentations where the grains of sand made the letters. And you'll see the file marks. If it's one out of a wax cast, or which is what they call lost cast, uh, lost wax production, it will be blurry and it won't be crisp. This one is good enough that it has fooled multiple people in our business. And it could be sold today, but I will never sell you something that I don't have faith in. I want you to realize this because it looks as nice as any buckle you will see, but it ain't real. I wish it was real because I could use a 30 grand a day. Uh, that would be my stimulus package, but I say this because I want you to be sure there are a lot of wonderful dealers out there. There are a lot of knowledgeable dealers. Anybody that's gonna sell you something should be willing to put a letter of authenticity behind it. And that letter is only as good as the person that is writing it. And there's a lot of good dealers, whether you get it from me or other ones out there. 
just stick with somebody you know and remember that if it sounds too good to be true, you are probably wasting your money. And in order to get that money back, you're going to have to screw somebody and don't do either. I hope that you've enjoyed today. I hope that you have learned a little bit. I hope that you are all kind to each other. Remember to take a second, say hi to somebody that you don't know, especially if, if they look like they're having a bad day. You might be the only person that acts like they care about them at all that whole day, and it won't take but a second, and they might remember it. I hope that you have a good day. I love you all, and I'll catch you next time. See ya.